have him tell you, has he told you a couple of Don Keys stories? No. Do me a favor. Tell him a couple of Don Keys Oklahoma stories at some point, okay? <laughs> it doesn't have to be about Ichabod. <laughs> <laughs> It's heavy, the third day of, of a Congress, uh, but we're still running to time and schedule, um, and that's great. Thank you all for your cooperation. This is the last of the talks which really look back into where we've been, where we've come from. And you'll see that as we move into the afternoon, we're going to be looking very much at where we're going. Mm -hmm. uh, both from our lunchtime speaker, uh, Bishop Bill Antwerp, and then um, our speaker this afternoon and workshops. Everything starts looking beyond this point to where we're going. So um, this is the last one of looking back. We had in our initial planning asked Ken Middleton uh, from the United Kingdom to be with us. It's a strange time to be meeting for those from uh, the United Kingdom. They're all on vacation at this time. Um, and so he, for various reasons, wasn't able to be with us to present a paper on the Anglican Congresses and, and to restoring the Anglican mind. Um, but Bishop Keith Ackerman said, I'll do it. And so he's going to be our guest speaker uh, just now on, on that subject. I also want to, just at this time, um, also extend to you greetings um, and love and support from Bishop Jack Eicher, who is on sabbatical. Uh, he, we're in his diocese. He would have loved to have been with us, but um, he well deserves a rest, and that's where he is. Uh, also, Bishop Mark Lawrence. Um, we had invited him to be part of this gathering, too. Uh, he too sent his regrets because he is away, also on a very well-deserved rest, and, uh, but promises his prayers and his love and support for us as we gather. So we thank them for that. So without further ado, the little bishop. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so very much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit and fill the hearts of your faithful people. And at the intercession of all the saints, may what we say and what we do be well-pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, over the last 40 years, I have had the privilege to go to the Holy Land 15 times. And being in the Holy Land has been a remarkable experience on a variety of levels. But apart from going to the holy sites, there are elements of human interaction that are very helpful. To some extent, in part, because we are able to see the Semitic mind in action. We are also able to see Middle Easterners in action overall. And to put into context many of the words and also many of the statements which oftentimes are forthcoming. One time when I was there, I was actually invited to participate in an ecumenical liturgy. Being from the United States, I had participated in ecumenical liturgies, occasionally reluctantly, oftentimes with elements of amusement, <laughs> and always with a resolve in part because it was appearing to be in many of those ecumenical liturgies that people did everything they could not to offend anybody else and occasionally attempt not to offend Jesus. But an ecumenical liturgy in the Holy Land is very different. <laughs> Methodists don't show up. <laughs> no Southern Baptist. No Geneva gowns. And suddenly I was faced, uh, as a young priest at that point, uh, with a number of jurisdictions. Now, for me, that was not all that alien. I'm from a part of the country where if somebody says I'm a Catholic, 
the usual response was, what kind? Are you Eastern right or are you Western right? And within the Eastern right, which type? And within the Western right, which type? Because truth be told, the average person, if they say today, I'm a Catholic, think that somebody's talking about the Latin right. But the number of rights within that church are, are numerous. Now, if that weren't enough, I actually was brought up with and served in an area where there were seven jurisdictions of Eastern Orthodox. They all knew they were right and all agreed on theology and disagreed over lamb. <laughs> the ways in which things were to be eaten or prepared, the customs and the traditions. To put it differently, being brought up in an area that was multi-ethnic was quite exciting. Somebody asked me once if I had ever participated in multiculturalism. I told them I had. It was called my first grade. <laughs> Seven different languages were spoken in my first grade class. Now, why does that mean anything? Well, what it means is that we approach life very often conditioned by the culture and subculture in which we found ourselves. And that ecumenical liturgy, which I discovered in Jerusalem, was extraordinary. It was the St. James Cathedral, which, as you know, is the Armenian Cathedral. <clears throat> it's also built over top of the site of the martyrdom of St. James. First Bishop of Jerusalem, and if that weren't quite enough, every square inch is used because there are at least 100 people who live on top of the cathedral. Apartments, rooms, convents, etc. In fact, it's located in the Armenian Quarter, a quarter which would appear to be oftentimes forgotten. But that should not be a surprise to us. With Armenia being the first Christian nation, should it be any surprise to us that they are oftentimes on the list of the persecuted and the forgotten? In that ecumenical liturgy, I discovered that everybody there was unwilling to say they were not a member of the true church. <laughs> everybody there was a member of the true church. Otherwise, they would not have shown up. And they were there to be able to celebrate that oneness. But that leads me now to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. One must certainly look at a watch. Well, for the few who actually follow watch time over there. And determine what time the next procession was going to be. Because it is not a happy day when the Armenians bump into the Franciscans at the same time in a procession because the one had already reserved the time. The varieties, not negatively, of jurisdictions and communions which share the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is magnificent. To see the pageantry but the awesome holiness that exists in that place is beyond measure. Anglicans, I suspect, when England became a part of that mix, the protectorate, had cut a very good deal with the Greek Orthodox. And that was the Greek Orthodox say, we will give you a chapel on top of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre if you won't disrupt anything going on below. <laughs> so going to Hagia Ibrahim, St. Abraham's Chapel, is a joy for Anglicans to be able to go and to celebrate Mass on top of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. However, to get there, one must pass a number of other jurisdictions, all of which claim the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is home. Well, that's the good news, I think. <laughs> But the bad news is trying to get in in the morning or being told to leave at night. Because then you have to negotiate with the Muslim family which holds the key. The key has been handed down from Muslim family to Muslim family, the same family, because since Christians had disagreed so much about who had what, it passed to the Muslims to be able to lock and unlock the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. <laughs> Uh, all of this, I think, is a parable. 
It's a sad parable of what's happened, except that there is one other statistic to throw in there. In my 40 years of going over there, having watched the Christian population of the Holy Land go from 33% down to less than 2% has been very sobering. So there are many people over there who are quite right. It's just not many of them left to be too right. And a parable for us to recognize as I go back and look carefully at the history of the Catholic Congresses is everybody seems to have been quite right. Everything was quite truthful. I, by the way, <clears throat> have discarded my presentation for this morning because I really want to share from my heart these certain realities and being able to read all of the proceedings, all of the official documents that were presented at the Catholic Congresses, what I discovered is that very few people were upset or disturbed by any of the official presentations. And I think the Catholic Congresses would have done better if they hadn't let the people out of the room eventually. <laughs> because as I read carefully all of what transpired, it was not what was said from the podium or the pulpit that became the problem. It's what people did with it when they left. One group in particular said they would not go to any more of those Catholic Congresses because there was an increase of Catholic priests who were married in the Anglican Communion. Duh. <laughs> Others said that they would not be going again because they felt that one particular group had been given more authority as the Catholic Congresses changed. To put it differently, the problem that really occurred with the Catholic Congresses, as some historians would say, was not World War II. It was Anglo-Catholic War I. Anglo-Catholics are not going to be a witness to the rest of the Anglican world or to the rest of the world if Anglo-Catholics do not learn how to work better together. It's pure and simple where it is. But it does not mean being polite. The dilemma in the church, what we call, on one hand, the halo effect, also produces, in many instances, passive-aggressive behavior. Passive-aggressive behavior I typify, to some extent, if you will work with me, uh, like the rear-engine Volkswagens. <laughs> and what that means is that our friend has just driven up to the stop sign in his rear-engine Volkswagen, and a man who he thinks is his friend, but who's really been angry with him, but has never told him how angry he is with him, sees this fellow at the stop sign. He goes over and he lifts the back and he yanks off the distributor cap and throws it in the bushes. Now our friend has his car and he's ready to go and he can't, but the gentleman who's just removed the distributor cap walks over and looks in the car and says, Oh, my friend, I'm so sorry. Is there a problem and can I help you? never acknowledging that he had become a part of the problem. Passive-aggressive behavior is oftentimes acceptable behavior in the church because people can say all manner of things and not be present for it. And the real challenge of the Catholic Congresses was trying to keep people together to speak. It was not what was happening here. It's what was happening when little groups gathered, two and three, saying, you heard that being said in there, but let me really tell you what's going on. It's that whole Gnostic phenomenon that occurs that has hurt us immensely. That is my inner information, not, not Catholic truth here, but my inner information which will give you a real insight to what's wrong with that person. At the moment, in the Catholic Congresses that individuals began to be discredited, we begin to see a reduction in numbers because difficult as it may be for people to believe, 
not everybody goes to congresses or gatherings so they can be told how miserable they are. <laughs> well, I counsel some folks like that, but that's a totally different subject. So we gather together so that we can hear the truth as difficult as it may be to hear, so that it can be processed. And what I'm about to say, I say with all due respect. This is an incomplete Congress without the Bible studies in the morning. And it's a totally incomplete experience without hearing the Bible studies in the morning. Because it sets the tone, it informs us, and it gets us to the point that we need to be so once the soil has been prepared and the seeds have been planted, in the course of the day it takes root. Similarly, even song is not an addendum that was put onto the schedule just so that we could make some rubrics or canons in the Church of England happy. Even song has a function and a role to complete our day by sanctifying time and space. And the marvelous thing about Anglo-Catholics is they believe in the spiritual disciplines of morning prayer and evening prayer of daily mass, if at all possible, of making their confessions regularly. Those are some of the hallmarks of being Catholic Christians. And many of the documents I read sounded as if people were telling all the other folks what they ought to be doing without taking responsibility for themselves for doing it. Priests should never hear confessions unless they make their own confessions, for example. It's all part of the spiritual discipline. And when I came to a realization of this inner turmoil, it's when I began to read disparaging comments being made about Bishop Weston. Apparently he said something that somebody didn't like and they wrote about it. The only thing I can say to the Bishop of Zanzibar is that I am so grateful that your predecessor did not live in the age of email and blog sites. <laughs> I've already read some things that we've said or not said here that people have forwarded to me, and they must be at another Congress. They're not at this one. And yet, with this age in which we live today, we can disseminate more unhelpful information in a matter of seconds than we did with the previous Catholic Congresses. Point being, behavior must change among Catholics so that we can model the faith. I was uh, mentored, one of my mentors was Father Joseph, the founder of the Order of St. Francis. And I would take communion to him regularly on the North Shore of Long Island when I was a young curate. And he would always ask interesting questions. He would say things like, Father, what are the Beatitudes? If I said I know Father, then I wouldn't get the story. Say, so I don't know, Father Joseph, what are the Beatitudes? And he said, attitudes you need to be at. <laughs> <laughs> and from that man, I learned, although do not necessarily always exercise, obviously, the gift of humility. Um, Anglo-Catholics have a great deal to be humble about, by the way. <laughs> We need to be humbled because we've been given the whole faith and we've been asked to pass it down. And that is an awesome responsibility. Father Canon Arthur Middleton has asked that I deliver his paper today. And I do so, but I use what I've just said as a segue. Because we are in that transitional time right now where we're looking back to the Congresses to find out why they worked and what prevented them from continuing and working so that we don't repeat some of those same dilemmas. And I'd like to read for you Canon Arthur Middleton's marvelous address today. Somebody will get me a step stool and some very handsome gray hair. I will do my best <laughs> to present it. <clears throat> The Congress and Restoring the Anglican Mind by Canon Arthur Middleton. 
A requested keynote address for the Congress. It comes with my apologies for not being able to attend because of family holidays and my thanks to Bishop Keith for volunteering to read it on my behalf. You will all be with me in my thoughts and prayers for God's blessing on the Congress and for your part in the restoration of the Anglican mind that under God will renew and reunite the Anglican communion. He begins, the Church of England uh, changes God's plan. The Church of England's General Synod's celebrations after the vote for women bishops indicated that the members had not realized how the vote signaled the death of the Church of England, becoming what Richard Hooker would describe as a sect of politically correct ideology. Fundamental in this Anglican communion crisis is the emergence of two incompatible and competing religions within the church that are not mere differences of emphasis, but profound differences about the content of Christian belief and the character of Christian life. They express themselves in the authority of experience over against the authority of divine revelation that is the basis of Christian orthodoxy. For the Orthodox Christian, truth with a capital T has been definitively revealed in Holy Scripture and authoritatively interpreted in the Christian tradition. The Christian's response is in terms of belief, understanding, and obedience. Relevance then becomes a matter of seeking to apply established doctrinal and moral standards to the situation in which he finds himself. He sees his church as divinely commissioned in faith and order to maintain the faith once for all delivered to the saints. With the responsibility of maintaining those standards essentially unchanged from one age to another. The issue of women in the apostolic ministry is fundamentally a matter of order and not of human rights. Which is not surprising when we speak about the apostolic ministry as holy orders. As the preface to our Anglican ordinal puts it, it is evident unto all men diligently reading holy scriptures and ancient authors that from the apostles' time there have been these orders of ministers in Christ's church, bishops, priests, and deacons. Their divine source and authority is God to whom they belong, and not men, which explains why these ancient orders are called holy, because they were given by God and because they were not devised by humans. Our prayer book collect for Ember Days, which is a prayer for ordinance, acknowledges this in praying to God, who is of his divine providence, has appointed diverse orders in his church. Richard Hooker, Anglican theologian par excellence, wrote, the ministry of things divine is a function which as God did himself institute. Those in holy orders, he says, are ministers of God as from whom their authority is derived and not from men. Hooker's regard for the ministry is immeasurable. He says, the power of the ministry of God translated out of darkness into glory, it raiseth men from the earth and bringeth God himself down from heaven. By blessing visible elements, it maketh them invisible grace. It giveth daily the Holy Ghost. Hooker says that in the light of so great power, we cannot imagine that any but God can bestow it. Bishop Jeremy Taylor, 1613 to 1667, another classical Anglican theologian, expresses similar respect for the divine grace of ordination. He says, the thing is sacred, separate, solemn, deliberate, derivative from God and not of human provision or authority or pretense or disposition. Holy orders, which are not from men, are of God's own plan and making. The blueprint and copyright of orders are clearly his, and they are found in God's own revelation of himself in Holy Scripture. The process that has promoted women in the apostolic ministry is a management exercise determined by politically correct ideology and not theological principle. And it reduces holy order to a functionalism, alters God's plan for holy order, and ignores our paramount duty to the universal church. In England, the appointment of a reconciler 
is part of the management method which according to the ACAS style of setting trade union disputes is to reconcile differing views. But this issue is not about human relations. It is about deeply held theological convictions that are diametrically opposed to the politically correct ideology. There can be no reconciliation. The vote signifies that the Church of England and where this has happened in elsewhere in other provinces of the Anglican Communion, Anglicanism is not being true to her Anglican mind. She has rejected the Judeo-Christian tradition and historic episcopate. And in other matters of fundamental doctrine and morals, this can happen again. She has ignored her own formularies expressed in Canon A5 of the English Church, the Book of Common Prayer, and the Ordinal, where apostolic order is there and enshrined. She has ignored her membership of the Universal Church and has been in a process of creeping schism from it for years. The ecumenical achievements of the past century, including Archic, have been destroyed for their has been a total disregard for church unity and an unwillingness to take seriously the warnings of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. So what is the point of the Archbishop of Canterbury's words to his ecumenical partners stressing the fact that we need each other and the importance of unity after an action that has placed an insuperable obstacle in the way of full communion? Actions speak louder than words. Professor Owen Chadwick wrote of Anglican divines in the 17th century, if high churchmen of that age like Bramhall or Thorndike had been asked what led them not to compromise, they would have replied in terms like the following. Our paramount duty is to the Catholic Church. Our subordinate and derivative duty is to the Church of England as the representative of the Catholic Church in this country. The Catholic Church is known by its faithfulness to the primitive model. The Church of England has no choice but to follow that model, must seek to apply the principle rigorously and exactly. I'm satisfied, wrote Thorndike in 1660, that the differences upon which we are divided cannot be justly settled upon any terms which are any part of the whole church shall have just cause to refuse as inconsistent with the unity of the whole church. Chadwick went on to say that any act which divides the Church of England from the universal church of the centuries is to be askewed, even if that act offers temporary or local advantage. And the test of universality in this sad divided state of Christendom may be found in appeal to the ancient and undivided church of the first centuries. According uh, to him, it has been the Anglican claim that in faith and order, the Anglican communion is continuous in identity with the primitive church. The principle was set forth by Bishop Jewell, one of the earliest Anglican apologists in the 16th century when he wrote, we are come as near we possibly could to the Church of the Apostles and of the old Catholic bishops and fathers. More than that, Anglicans have continuously insisted that the primitive church of the undivided centuries is a doctrinal model. We are willing to own this for a true mark of the church, wrote William Payne. It's agreeing with the doctrine of the primitive church. As McAdoo points out, that is, in its constitution, the Church of Ireland doth as heretofore accept and unfeignedly believe all the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testament as given by inspiration of God and containing all things necessary to salvation, and doth continue to profess the faith of Christ as professed by the primitive church. The principle was again underlined in the preface to the Irish revision of the Book of Common Prayer in 1878. All men profess their love and reverence for the Book of Common Prayer and its main substance and chief parts, and confess that it contained the true doctrine of Christ in a pure manner and order of divine service according to the Holy Scripture, the practice of the primitive church. 
He sees this as the attitude to the basic concept formulated. For example, in Jude 3, the faith once for all delivered to the saints, and is expressed in the Church of England's Canon A5. This is formative for the Anglican ethos, and it means that the content of faith cannot be changed by addition or omission, though each generation needs to develop into a deeper understanding of it and to express it in the idiom of its own time. The faith does not grow, but the members of the church grow into it according to the measure and capacity of man's developing self-understanding and comprehension of his world. Canon then goes on to say, does this preclude any developments? Michael Ramsey in the Gospel in the Catholic Church posed this question, quote, in the Church of the New Testament we find baptism, Eucharist, apostles. In the subsequent centuries we find baptism, Eucharist, the bishops, the Bible, creeds. In what sense do these marks of the Church declare or obscure the Gospel of God? End quote. He then goes on to show that the form of the ministry of the canon of Scripture and of the creeds work interdependently towards a twofold continuum of objective. That objective is to maintain the church in the truth of the faith once for all delivered and to help members of the church to express the fullness of membership in and for the world. Ramsey then leads straight into what might be called a first distinguishing feature of Anglicanism as he relates the Anglican stress on the once for all character of the gospel in the question of developments. He says, developments then took place, but they were all tested. The tests of a true development are whether it bears witness to the gospel, whether it expresses the general consciousness of the Christians, and whether it serves the organic unity of the body in all its parts. These tests are summed up in the scriptures, wherein the historical gospel and the experience of the redeemed and the nature of the one body are described. Hence, while the canon of scripture is in itself a development, it has a special authority to control and to check the whole field of development in life and doctrine. Judged by these tests and by scripture which sums them up, the marks of the church which we have just described are abundantly vindicated. There is thus raised, Canon says, at once the matter of scripture being the standard and test of the truth of faith, and this, as the preamble and preface already quoted indicate, is one of the essential aspects of the Anglican Communion's understanding of the faith. But to recapitulate, there is then no distinctively Anglican faith as such, but rather the explicit claim of adherence to nothing but the once faith for all delivered. This is what we mean by the Anglican mind. What this means is that there are no distinctively Anglican beliefs but only the Christian faith as lived, proclaimed, and taught by Anglicans. It was an attempt to set out factually a vital principle which has impelled Anglicanism to assert unequivocally its continuity of adherence to the unchanging faith, quote, keep safe that which has been entrusted to you, 1 Timothy, keep before you an outline of the sound teaching which you heard, 2 Timothy. It has always been the Anglican claim that in faith and order, the Anglican communion is continuous in identity with the primitive church. I'd like to read that again. This is me speaking. It has always been the Anglican claim that in faith and order, the Anglican communion is continuous in identity with the primitive church. It is no new church. Today's contest is between model, modern liberal ecclesiology and the Anglican mind in a time when the majority of people in the church and the nation have been brainwashed by the secular mind, which they use to displace the claims of the Anglican mind. It is the presuppositions of the secular mind and its politically correct ideology 
that is determining the faith and order of the Anglican communion that must be displaced. This is not a matter of politics, but a matter of faith and theology. Like the divines of the 17th century, the way forward is by pursuing the Anglican way back to prescriptive sources by upholding Canon A5, which states that the doctrine of the Anglicanism is grounded in the Holy Scripture and in such teachings of the ancient fathers and councils of the church are as agreeable to the said scriptures. In particular, such doctrine is to be found in the 39 articles, the Book of Common Prayer and the Ordinal. The Anglican mind asserts the conception of the church as inherited, founded by the Lord himself, perpetuated by direct succession from the apostles, one in continuous history and in doctrine with the primitive church, filled with a supernatural and sacramental life, witnessing to a high moral standard before the world. Our aim must be to assert the reality of the church as a spiritual body perpetuated by the apostolic succession recognizing that we have received our church from the apostles and so work for the reinstatement of discipline and doctrine in the prevailing secularization and dysfunctioning of the Anglican communion. Such a conception of the church assumes certain truths and facts. That our Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, very God of very God, that he became incarnate for us men and for our salvation, that he died for our sins and rose for our justification, that he founded the church to be the sphere in which his gifts of knowledge and grace might be received, and that the New Testament is a dependable source of Christian truth. The redemption of mankind was accomplished by our Lord when in the ascension he presented to the Father his finished work. But the results of that work had yet to be developed and applied. As the ascension followed on from the death and resurrection, so also the, the ascension itself led to the descent of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the third person of the Holy Trinity, who had always since the creation had his work on earth, was now sent by God the Son from the God the Father in a new manner and with new operations. The people of God, who in Old Testament times had received God's special vocation and had been in special fashion the instrument of his will, was now to be filled with new power. The little remnant of the chosen race, which had been faithful in the supreme crisis of their vocation and had accepted our Lord as the Messiah and had become his disciples, inherited the promises to the race and was made to be the Christian church and filled with the Holy Ghost. For Hooker, the grace of the sacraments is the last link in a series whose terminus is the participation of the worshiper in the life of God. The church, thus formed, was the instrument of God. It had its divinely appointed work of teaching and hallowing those who, through its missionary efforts, should become Christians. As the teacher of truth and the home of grace, it was in the power of the Holy Ghost to make the gifts of God through the Incarnation effective in human lives. On its outward side, it was a company of men and women and children united in fellowship of life and prayer, which was sustained by the teaching of the apostles and by sacramental grace. In its inward being, it was the bride and body of Christ, the shrine of the Holy Ghost, the family of God. As time went on and the church grew, its limits were clearly seen. The members of the church were those who believed the Orthodox faith, who had been baptized into the body of Christ, and who continued in communion with the Episcopal ministry, which had descended from the apostles. The church is the teacher of truth. The method of its teaching may take different forms. There is the promulgation of Holy Scripture, there are the decisions of councils. There are the utterances of accredited teachers. There are the necessary inferences from worship. In each case, what is important is how far that which is taught is the right and permanent expression of the church's mind, which in our case is the Anglican mind. Canon Arthur goes on. 
promulgating Holy Scriptures. Here, the Anglican Communion has given Holy Scripture a very distinctive place. Phrases such as that Holy Scripture is the Word of God, or that God is the author of Holy Scripture, or that through Holy Scripture the Holy Ghost spoke, have been frequently used and have been accepted with a greater or less degree of authority. The written Word of God has often been compared with the personal Word of God, in such a way as it suggests some correspondence between the revelation in Holy Scripture and the revelation in the Incarnation. With these expressions, a pronounced view of the authority of Holy Scripture has been associated for a long period of time and by very many teachers. Such a view of Holy Scripture was the most usual way of regarding it in the early church. Here he quotes Maskell. I maintain that the needed identification of the Christ whom I meet today with the Christ of whom I read in the scriptures, the Gospels, is provided by the church, Christ's body, as the concrete extension through the centuries of the human nature which the Son of God assumed at his incarnation, in which he performed his reconciling and salvific acts, and into which he has incorporated a multitude of men and women from then until now. And it's from his body, this body, that I receive the accounts of his visible earthly acts in the Gospel writings. He goes on to say that the New Testament must then be understood as the church's articulation in its earliest days of its experience of the Lord whose body it knew itself to be. An experience of no merely subjective and psychological kind, but one which was rooted in the incorporation of its members into the human nature of the church, who had died and risen again, and whose teaching had burnt itself unforgettably into the minds of his hearers. He quotes Maskell again, the church's thought and therefore its theology must thus be grounded on the New Testament though not on the New Testament conceived as an external authority standing over against the church and outside it. What makes the New Testament authoritative and normative for the church's life? What makes it the standard by which developments are to be judged and divagations corrected is precisely the fact that it is the voice of Christ's mystical body. We might even say the voice of Christ speaking through the lips of his mystical body speaking in the days when it was closest to those salvific acts by which it was created and endowed with the Spirit. The sacred scriptures are thus part, and indeed the normative part, of the tradition. The paradosis, which in every age the body of Christ communicates to its members. Canon Middleton. Anglican theological method has from its beginning always included as integral concern for church history and the proper historical setting or context of the Bible, that is, the living apostolic community, the Catholic Church of the Fathers, which ensures authoritatively, normatively, and critically the historic continuity of the apostolic community and her apostolic faith and praxis. This ecclesial dimension the patristic and Catholic ecclesiastic confronema was appropriated by Anglicanism and made the basis of Christian living, the context of Christian thinking. Ecclesiastical understanding does not attempt to add anything to Scripture, but to ascertain and disclose fully the true meaning of Scripture. As Hansen put it, quote, The life of Christianity depends upon the church dancing with the Bible and the Bible with the church. The church may indeed be lost without the Bible, but the Bible without the church is dead. A collection of ancient documents and no more. This is R.P.C. Hansen, the Bible is a norm of faith. The Jesuit theologian, Father George Tavar, claimed that in making scripture the self-evident basis of Anglicanism, but a long tradition is mutually inclusive, a consistency with the patristic mind is maintained, he says. The Anglican Church tried to maintain the Catholic notion of perfect union between church and scripture. 
The statement of Johann Gropper that the church's authority is not distinct from that of scripture, but rather that they are one, corresponds to the Anglican view of the early church, as it corresponds to the Catholic conception of the church at all times. <coughs> Tavard pointed out that most theologians of the Counter-Reformation separated scripture and tradition at different times, making one or the other a partial source of faith. He added that in both cases, the theology of the Catholic eras, patristic and medieval, was better represented by the Anglican view by many Catholic, than by many Catholic writers in the Counter-Reformation period. The ecclesial context of Anglican divinity understands the church as bearing witness to the truth, not merely from written documents, but from its own living and ceasing experience from its Catholic fullness. This has its roots in continuity with the primitive church, where the mind of Christ and the mind of the church are mutually interrelated. It is in this person and in this mind that the historic tradition has its power and beginning and where the mind of the church is established. This is what constitutes that quote, tradition of truth, end quote, in which, as Florovsky reminds us, the quote, apostolic teaching is not so much an unchangeable example to be repeated or imitated as an eternally living and inexhaustible source of life and inspiration. Tradition is the constant abiding spirit, not only the memory of words, it is therefore a charismatic, not an historical principle, but together with scripture, contains the truth of divine revelation, a truth that lives in the church. The experience of the church has not been exhausted either in scripture or tradition. It is only reflected in them. Therefore, only within the church does scripture live and become vivified. Only within the church is it revealed as a whole and not broken up into separate texts, commandments, and aphorisms. This means that scripture has been given in tradition, but not in the sense that it can be understood only according to the dictates of tradition, or that it is the written record of historical tradition or oral teaching. Scripture needs to be explained. It is revealed in theology. This is possible only through the medium of the living experience. This is the ecclesiasticon frontema, the ecclesiastical mind, and it has been one of the outstanding characteristics of the Anglican Church in all the principal period of its life, and is what distinguished it from continental Protestantism. It reveals that the Anglican Communion is no new church. The Catholic appeal to authority is partly to the past. It looks back to Holy Scripture, to the doctrinal statements in which the church has drawn out the meaning of Holy Scripture, and which have been accepted as creeds, to the conciliar decisions which have been authoritatively imposed as binding on the whole church, to the common teaching of representative divines. The Catholic may not reject anything to which he believes that the church as a whole is really committed. Anything which the whole church has made part of its permanent life. It may often be a difficult task to determine exactly how far the authority of the church has gone, whether the decision of an accepted ecumenical council has been so completely a matter of principle that it may not be altered or has been so entirely a detail of only temporary importance that it may well be changed, whether, for instance, any utterance is to be ranked within the affirmation of our Lord's deity at the Council of Nicaea, or with the prohibition of kneeling during Eastertide by the same council, whether the concurrent teaching of divines through a long period of time indicates an actual acceptance of the teaching by the church itself, but whenever it can be determined that there has been a decision to which the church as a whole is permanently committed, the acceptance of that decision is obligatory. But besides the appeal to the past, there is also an appeal to the future. 
The Catholic of necessity looks back to the past, for in the past is the tradition which sustains his belief. But of necessity, also he looks forward to the future, to the reunited church which is to be. And he sees that the past will find its full significance in the development which yet has to come. For the church's life is greater than that of any one century or of any particular series of centuries. It is for all time. He says, answering for the faith. To repeat, the Anglican communion is not a new church. But if politically correct ideology is allowed to prevail, it will recreate Anglicanism into a new church, a new religion which will not be Christianity nor the Catholic faith as understood by the Anglican communion. He asks, how best can I help? There are ways of serving the church which are suited to every temperament. The present time, with its attendant shadow of future events, demands that Christians everywhere should strengthen their spiritual loyalties and give their best. This is not so much an age of unbelief as of wrong belief. There are many claimants for human personality today, many isms, many ologies, which offer themselves as the only way to peace, contentment, and security. The pressure of events has brought about a new desire to think out afresh the implications of the Catholic faith. The Christian religion in most parts of the world, there is a need for theological revival which endeavors to apply to world affairs the great central Christian beliefs concerning God, man, the God-man, Christ Jesus. The Catholic faith is not an escape pit for those who would turn aside to escape the pressing problems of life. Rather, does it assert certain facts which can alone form a basis of any successful world order. But such revival must begin in the heart before the head. We must still face the urgent need of understanding our religion, that we may be able to give an answer concerning the faith that is in us. Only personal religion can explain the Christian faith to ourselves and enable us to explain it to others. But explain it and present it if its claims are true, we must. As a parish priest, I was asked to rescue a man's daughter and her family from the hands of Jehovah's Witnesses. What impressed me was the number of books they had collected to inform themselves about Watchtower religion. As Anglicans, they had never read any books to my knowledge. <laughs> Yet, that is where lay people can begin to equip themselves with reading about what the Catholic faith is in their own homes and in the formation of oratories where prayer and discussion can further inform the heart and mind. Perhaps a follow-up from this Congress might be the compiling of a suitable reading list with the help of the parish press <laughs> of books by such authors as E.O. Maskell's Death or Dogma, showing the implication of Christian doctrine about God and man for society, books by C.S. Lewis on Christian belief and behavior, explanations of the Catholic faith and G.D. Carlton's the King's Highway, or Vernon Staley's The Catholic Religion, to mention a few. And now he says, let the resolution of the Congress be in the restoration of the Anglican mind. Bullet point one. To pursue the Anglican way by upholding Canon A5, which states that the doctrine of the Anglican communion is grounded in the Holy Scripture, a divine inheritance, and conveying life through its sacraments. This is against the innovations of the liberals reflected in the pervasive humanism and apostasy in the church and sometimes supported by politicians and the judges who use equality law to discriminate against Orthodox Christians and persecute them. Bullet point two. To assert the authoritative doctrinal character of our Anglican formularies as against the liberalism so often evident in the deliberations of the synods. Bullet point number three, to recall Anglicans to the revival of neglected truth and principles of actions which had been in the minds of our predecessors of the 17th century. As the Oxford Fathers urged, stir up the gift of God that is in you. 
Next bullet point. To uphold and elucidate the doctrines of the Catholic faith as Anglicans have received them and to work for the expression of such doctrine by the avoidance of the dumbing down effect of the language of political correctness and liturgy and biblical translations. Next bullet point. To resist today's new insidious Erastianism, the interference of the government in the affairs of the church, whereby a government can dictate to the church what its doctrine and morality should be as a result of various types of discriminatory law. Next bullet point. To work for the unity and truth and holiness of all Christians and as Anglicans to bring our own characteristic contribution as our fathers have taught us according to the apostolic doctrine and polity of our church. Next bullet point. To bring recognition to the reality that the way of salvation is the partaking of the body and blood of our sacrificed Redeemer by means of the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist. And that that's a security for the due application of this is the Apostolic Commission. We cannot and do not accept, therefore, the innovation of women priests and women bishops, since sacraments are from God and we cannot tamper with them. The sacraments must never be humanly manipulated on the basis of the politico-sociological arguments of the times and so-called human rights. Final bullet point. To be on our watch for all opportunities of inculcating a due sense of this inestimable privilege to provide and circulate information, to familiarize the imaginations of people with the idea, to attempt to revive among churchmen the practice of daily common prayer and the more frequent participation in the Eucharist. Conclusion. In the spirit of John Henry Newman, the aim is not the seeking of our own well-being or originality or some new invention for the church. Let our prayer be that God will give us sound judgment, patient thought, discrimination, a comprehensive mind and abstinence from all private fancies and caprices and personal tastes. Let us seek only the standards of saintliness and service as the measure of our activities. Let the secret for us lie in those words of our Lord's high priestly prayer. For their sakes I consecrate myself, so uniting his humanity with God in the way of holiness, that he may capture the reality of that life within the blessed Trinity and be inspired by the divine life he lives with Christ in the Holy Spirit. For it is only as we make our home in him, as he made his home in the Father, that we will be able to do anything. There is the ultimate secret of power, the one sure way of doing good in our generation. We cannot anticipate or analyze the power of a pure and holy life, but there can be no doubt about its reality, and there seems no limit to its range. We can only know in part the laws and forces of the spiritual world. And it may be that every soul that is purified and given up to God and to his work releases or awakens energies of which we have no suspicion. Energies viewless as the wind, but we can be sure of the result, and we may have glimpses sometimes of the process. Surely there is no power in the world so unerring or so irrepressible as the power of personal holiness. All else at times goes wrong, blunders, loses proportion, falls disastrously short of its aim, grows stiffer, one-sided, or out of date. Quote, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But nothing mars or misleads the influence that issues from a pure and humble and unselfish character. A man's gift may lack opportunity. His efforts may be misunderstood and resisted. But the spiritual power of a consecrated will need no opportunity and can enter where the doors are shut. By no fault of a man's own, his gifts may suggest to some the thoughts of criticism, comparison, competition. His self-consecration can do no harm in this way. 
of gifts. Some are best for long distances. Some for objects close at hand or in direct contact. But personal holiness, determining, refining, characterizing everything that a man says or does will tell alike on those he may not know even by name and on those who see him in the constant intimacy of his home. Amen. I would like all of you to face northeast and applaud Canon Middleton. <laughs> Thank you. Ha, 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 ha